No mai ki tēnei wiki o kōrero toi. Uh, nei rā te mihi kia koutou, ko whakawhiri mai nei kia tātou uh, o te atinga. Uh, ki te tāho i nei mātanga i roti te ao toi e whakauhari ane ngā mahi toi i roti i ngā whare whakātū toi. Uh, nei rā te mihi kia koutou, ko whakawhiri mai nei i tēnei rā, whale i kōrero ko Nathan, uh, tēnei te mihi kia koutou. So, tēnā koutou, uh, just lovely to be here today. I'm located in the Toi Māori office, actually, and behind me we have Fiti Fidia, uh, the exhibition that's being exhibited today by some amazing weavers. And so if any of you are in Wellington, Courtney Place, please pop up here to the show the works are on point. Um, but apart from that today, I'm really proud uh, and happy to have Holly Tafiao and Nathan Poorhill join us today, tēnā kōrua. Um, and I was really excited when they said they could join us because uh, for me, these two people really uh, are able to bring strong contrast, but show uh, really where our toe Māori in terms of whakātu e ngā whakāro toi um, where we're going to today. So thank you, Kōrua, for coming. Um, first of all, we'll, um, I'll introduce Nathan, Kapai, and um, we'll get started. So I'm just going to open your little bow here, Nathan, that I prepared. I uh, hope you don't mind. So Nathan Pohil is from Waitaha, Kati Mamoi, and Ngaitahu Iwi uh, in Te Waitonamu. Uh, as the new Senior Curator of Māori Art at Auckland Art Gallery, Toi O Tāmaki, Pōhio brings almost 20 years of experience to the position, where he has worked in many galleries and curatorial positions, including a recent term at the Christchurch Art Gallery. Um, and I was blown away, actually, by an exhibition, Te Whike, and we had a bit of a quarter about it earlier, uh, and those... Uh, wonderful connections that we have from Waiatea and uh, throughout the Pacific. But anyway, uh, mm. I'll let Nathan talk more about uh, his curatorial practice. Uh, and as a visual artist, uh, Nathan's work has been exhibited throughout Aotearoa, New Zealand and internationally in galleries, museums, and huge events such as Scape 8, New Intimacies, Auckland Art Gallery, Te Tamaki, uh, Te Tuhi, and has even undertaken residencies in New Mexico, France, and Australia. So quite a worldly person. Uh, and I'll pass the rako over to you, Nathan, and um, mau te wā e hoa tēnā koe. Tēnā koe, uh, Regan, and tēnā koe, uh, kia ora ano, uh, Holly. Kia ora. Um, thank you for the very kind introduction. That was lovely. And... Um, uh, there's a lot of memories that sort of come back when you hear things about yourself like that. I've got some works that I think you might like to present. I don't know if they're showing, but they might just guide me through what we might talk about today. I just think I just thought because um, I've started work at um, Toyo Tamaki Auckland Art Gallery, I would um, begin with uh, my time in the with the Walters Prize. Um, and bringing my tupuna uh, light box up to the forecourt there and um, uh, just a way to locate myself in this city um, from a few years ago that was 2016 and uh, to sort of demonstrate how I the depth or, or the cultural responsibility of that work, um, rather than just bring my tupuna up into the rohi of Ngāti Whātua, um, uh, I was really challenging myself with how you bring your tupuna into someone else's um, takiwa. And on the last day of trying to resolve this and, and, and confirm that that would be the site for the work, 
um, I remembered that there was a Gottfried Lindauer portrait of Hakapu Te Atua II um, in the collection of Auckland Art Gallery. And, um, and I thought, well, let's make this the work that we hang the, first of all, we hang the portrait of Hakapu uh, Rangatira from Tuahiwi, which is the same site at the same um, uh, hapu uh, of my tupuna on horseback and the image there. If we hang that painting, um, Nigel Burrell kindly agreed to hang it in the tower, clock tower gallery. And, um, and then we installed the work to mihi that tupuna. And, uh, and then the next image over, you'll see the light box, the same light box work it got invited into um, Documenta 14 in 2017. And that's the work situated in the um, on the old vineyard there of a, of a very, very wealthy family. The, the same cultural values uh, were instilled into that site. I was trying to, again, well, how do you locate your tupuna in someone else's country, the other, another city in another part of the world? And trying to find ways to sell, satisfy that cultural need and um, that matauranga, <clears throat> and um, uh, and I got lost, separated from the rest of the artists when we were looking around the city, looking at different sites and things. Kilda, and um, and uh, I got lost, and I returned to a site that my curator uh, and assistant had taken me to uh, the day before. And I returned to that site, and they. On that particular location was the um, Grimm's World Museum, which is the Grimm Brothers Museum, and um, uh, and I spent about an hour and a half in there. And as I was leaving, now the Grimm's, of course, wrote all those Gothic fairy tales, and um, they also wrote the English, the um, German dictionary. They they worked very hard at that, and um, an incredible work put into that. It took 126 years or something for the German dictionary to get made. And so it went throughout their lives and then onto other people's lives and across Tilda Wars before it was finished. But um, in that museum, as I was leaving, um, this little thing just went at me. And I was like, all right, who are you? And it was about six or seven meters away. And I walked over to it. And it was just amongst a whole row of pictures that were on there. They were sideways to me. I couldn't see any of them they were in profile and I walked over to it and there was a copy of the rangatira um, painted by Sidney Parkinson and um, Cook's second voyage to Aotearoa and um, Jacob young Jacob Grimm had copied it the draw the print out of a, an encyclopedia or something and um, and uh, I felt like I'd been called over to that little pencil drawing. It was maybe about this big. And thought, well, what we did in Auckland, I think, is happening here in Castle. And that's how the work came to be located there. If we um, move over to past Castle, uh, Regan, and, and we'll just we'll start flicking through. Now, here we are in Athens with uh, the um, curatorial crew and my whanaunga uh, from Rapaki and uh, uh, Waihau. And um, we're settling in our tupuna there in Athens. You can see the tupuna up above. And um, it's a less formal photograph in that situation. And we've just had our um, karakia to settle them and had a good conversation with them and sung to them. And, uh, and just warm the space. And, and that's, we go to the next image now. Um, oh, here is a work of mine, uh, one of my more recent works. This is from, I can't remember, I think it's 2020. And I, I called the installation, The Mist in the Horizon. Now it's a collab with my friend Luke. Um, oh God. Not Luke Wood, um, the other one. <laughs> He's a sound artist. And um, and the kind of ideas around 
representing the idea of um, Marco and for us down south, uh, Mohoranu Iatia, the horizon. And I don't know for up here, but for down home, the union of the of the the moisture and the horizon. Um, from that um, union, we get our offspring, um, which include Ranginui, um, Papatuanuku, um, among uh, many others. And often the background there is uh, Tamata Urai, uh, the forked lightning. And um, so in, in this work, I was looking at um, further back into our creation story or the, the, the period before the, the creation story and and how things come into being um, in the in the cosmos and um, so if we flick through a few of these and I had no visual um, code if you like or reference to um, think about representing these um, tupuna uh, these uh, deities sorry is um, Tupuna as um, as an image or as a as, or as an artwork, and um, so I just um, what I decided to do was work along the, the abstract lines that you see in um, weaving and kofi fi and uh, fukado, and just let that kind of guide guide me through, and um, it was really quite a um, liberating experience particularly after the previous where um i was really really bound by everything including the image um there was very little besides looking after being responsible for the work there was very little creativity going on aesthetically if you like besides proportions and scale and things like that so it was really really nice to get my hands into some color the red, the black, and the white, uh, the forms, the angles, and think about um, these deity like that. And we can go over to the next ones now. Um, this is just the back of some screens. Oh, let's keep moving through. Here's our forked lightning. Uh, this is um, Mauna Tiri, or um, the, the, the title of this work is uh, Let It Be to a Lofty Mountain. And it's um, my Tupuna mountain, Malkatiri, just north of Tuahiwi um, in Te Waiponamu. And it's, uh, it's a mountain I'd, I'd uh, climbed quite a few times to get to familiar with, to get to know a wee bit. And, um, and then on two, one weekend, I, I did two trips up there. And um, it only takes about an hour and hour and three quarters, an hour and a quarter or something to climb up there. So it's it's not too bad. And um you can see the the rocks here. This was kind of I kind of sort of stayed around the car park area rather than ascending to the very top uh, for the purpose of this. Um kind of around around the collar, if you like, of my tupuna. Um it was at the very top is tussock. Which is uh by, but it's it's you know it's kind of all the same. Tussock's kind of samey, but the rocks here, they they there's actually a face where two um plates seem to meet, or it certainly suggests that that the, the rock has been pushed up out, out of the fenua and it's dry and so brittle. You can pick up a piece of rock and just crumble it. It's so weather worn. And um, but it's absolutely beautiful. And here it is on this um, large LED video screen in the Great Hall of the Art Center in Otatahi Christchurch. I don't have an image of um, the representation of Māori in that stained glass window uh, behind, but it absolutely is descriptive of the colonial. Uh, representation of Māori um, within the education sector of Ōtātahi Christchurch. And the education sector is actually something that's quite important to me uh, in terms of we don't teach our own history, 
And at once upon a time when I was quite young, uh, our history teacher uh, explained to us how the word kawanatanga uh, when teaching our own history was actually illegal to define. And um, so when you think that a word is actually illegal to define within our own education system, um, what else is up? And uh, that's something else to talk about, but not for this occasion, but um, it's, it's something that I'm going to be dealing with in the next few years, I think. This beautiful installation, um, uh, if we go through a few more images, just scroll through. I took around 700 photographs and stitched them all together into what I call sliders, like film strips, if you like. And um, there's the window. Now, in that stone, stained glass window there, you see how immense it is. That video screen is 2.1 meters high by seven meters across. Now, if you think about that in terms of that window, that window is about 10 to 12 meters high and about eight meters across or six, seven meters across. In that bottom right-hand corner, you see a little bit of green and a little bit of red. That's where the one Māori is in that massive narrative. And he's got his hand on his taiaha like this, and the pastor has his arm on the on the chief's hand, wrist like this, indicating power. You know, that's what's going on in that that bottom right hand corner. Uh, it's infuriating, and but it's something that we have to deal with. And the um, and it's how you deal with it. I think is is half half the battle. Um, but the institution was very, very keen for me to come in and do this work with them and address that. And in their speeches, they were like, you know, we are Pākehā and, uh, and we have to deal with this history and our education as well. So let's do this together. It was, it was really powerful. Um, let's go to the, one of the other images. More rocks there, you see. Oh, here is um, a bit of curatorial practice going on. Um, this is from Te Whiki, Pathways Across Oceania. Uh, the, it was a response to the director um, Blair Jackson's challenge to the curatorial staff to think about the architecture of the building and how we might look to our next collection changeover. Te Whiki Pathways Across, Te Whiki is basically a collections exhibition and it's a part of a new model that we were that the Christchurch Art Gallery Te Punaua Waifuri was put in place to have the collection area um, exhibitions last for two years rather than say one year. And, um, and that changeovers would happen as they needed to happen within that for whatever, usually conservation or loans purposes. Um, but that would be the driver and um, and knowing those spaces well, because I'd, I'd worked at the, that institution for 19 years and I was an exhibition designer slash tech, you know, team leader on the floor for about 13 or 14 years of that. And um, so I knew those spaces that lay out that map really well. And it just immediately hit me that we could talk about. And also there was the curatorial interest in, in looking at where we were in the world and how we're going to talk about ourselves as part of a, a larger oceanic um, community. And uh, so with those two things, I, I um, came up with the idea of Te Whiki, remembering a map of an octopus with tentacles going out to all the different islands from when I was at art school back in the 1990s and applied that to the floor plan and it just worked magically. Um, the space that we're in, can we go back one? Because we'll just we'll just look at John Pulley um, and ooh, Edith Amaturi over there. I bought both of those works for the show. And in the foreground there in the center is a um, an unknown origin uh, 
object, a square object, which um, uh, is incised with carving. And we're not sure from which island, but I came across that piece actually in the Canterbury Museum collections with Arnie O'Neill. And Arnie instantly recognized she's a, a fantastic um, vessel of knowledge and uh, as well as a beautiful person and great artist. And uh, she shared with me the insight on the, the, the um, significance of the carving pattern, which is basically two warriors back to back with their arm and leg outstretched. So it looks like a lot of Ks that are like that and then like that. And it's just repeated all around and all over the top. And so it's two, two, two toa with their supporting each other. It's about union and support and that kind of thing, solidarity. So if we go now to the next space. So that was the first space he entered, was that space. And it was looking at the um, uh, Pacifica whanau. In here was um, Tangata Whenua. And uh, so I called this space Atia as a cleared space for um, council or conversation, or hui. And I thought if I just clear the space, then the works will do all the talking. And, um, uh, and so here we have Lisa Rehana. Off in the distance is Darren George. And to the right is um, one of two, uh, the first half of a complete work by Fred Graham. It's made up, it's in two parts, as I mean to say, and that's one of them. That's um, Papatua Noku there, and the other one that, that um, reaches across the space uh, towards it is Bungi. And in the foreground is Roy Cohen. Um, uh, and this, with that beautiful, crazy, great ceramic there. Excuse me, let's go to the next one. The, the Fred, Fred Graham actually was 1996 and he was on residency in Ototahi. Um, and he made a, 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 a Te Waipaunamu a depiction of Rangi and Papa. The dark area there, the light meter, the light shiny stuff is metal and the dark behind it is Ponamu. And uh, so it's distinctly Te Waipaunamu, Kilda. And the Southern Alps there. Uh, looking across the space from the Darren George, Lisa Rehana corner, uh, across back. See the Roy Cohen there. You saw the, see the um, Fred Graham's to the left. There's Robin Kahukiwa off in the distance. There are four panels from the um, Makutu tomb uh, from Bay of Plenty, which I, a conversation I can get into in a, in a moment. Often the next to that in the foreground is uh, on the on the plinth there is a tiny kitty, kiwi kitty by um, yep by Kath Brown uh, and then there's the button in the corner there and haymaker Shane Cotton's immense and fantastic haymaker off to the side the um, uh, the presence of the carving here is because of course, we, ex we uh, acknowledge our tupuna uh, first and foremost. And so we have tupuna um, uh, from Canterbury Museum uh, on loan in the exhibition. And I don't quite know why exactly I hung them like this. I wanted to do something that was more asymmetrical than the usual symmetry that we see. I don't know, I can't explain myself, I'm sorry. Um, I just was really driven to, um, I guess kind of disrupt the normal way that, uh, the museological way that these things are presented, I suppose. And, um, and I just wanted us to be able to look at them anew. I guess that was it. And hopefully I've done nothing wrong in doing so. Um, certainly uh, all the conversations that were had and uh, before it were taking place, the Canterbury Museum's cultural advisory group um, had put me in touch with um, members of a representative, sorry, uh, of uh, Makitu and, um, uh, not Makitu, what am I, yeah, yeah, 
and uh, I asked them how many how many um, tupuna can I show for them, and they said hang as many as you can. <laughs> I was able to get four that were fit for for exhibition. If we keep moving along, how's my time? I should wrap up. Okay, there's Michael Padikofa and Lisa Rehana. Um, I've been blessed to work with uh, Michael recently in support of Tani um, Miti at the um, Auckland Art Gallery. It's been that's been really cool. But um, yeah, fantastic work by Michael there. And there's a larger copy of that. Oh, this is the video just to let you have some sense of what the music was like for that work so if you start again and i'll just i'll just be quiet now and finish here can you hear oh, your microphone is off maybe that helps then uh... sorry can you hear it Don't think so. Oh well, that's all right. That was just gonna that was just gonna be a nice little treat to finish on. Mm -hmm. That's um uh Tristan um Dingman there uh of Kahu Group and um Mountain Eater and HDU and uh he I I asked him to come up from Dunedin and um commissioned him to perform a sound I do a sound performance for my manga. I'm a huge fan of Dingman's and his work. And uh, he did a beautiful drenching soundscape uh, that just lifted, sent people off to, to sleep. <laughs> it just gently, it gently um, soothed a lot of people in the place. We had just sort of come out of the, out, it was our first public thing out of COVID. Uh, Everyone was, you know, spaced and all the rest of it. And it was a very nice, quiet event. A good way to get back in touch with each other again. Uh, kia ora. Oh, that's wonderful, Nathan. Thank you so much. I apologise for the audio. I'm not quite sure what's happening. That's okay. That's right. But thank you. That was wonderful. And um, we'll, um, it's um, 12.30 now, so we'll just um, hop over to Holly. Um, but we'll come back to you, Nathan. And um, anybody who's got some questions, please enter them in the chat. And uh, we'll have some time at the end to um, answer any questions or have a bit of a portable. And we would love to hear more from you, Nathan, about your mahi. Um, so, We'll just uh, go over to this very special wahine, Holly Tafiao. So um, Holly is Ngāti Tipa and Port Waikato, and she's come on the scene in the Waikato with a piss and a raw and a bang. <laughs> uh, and she's making some uh, huge statements and some huge, uh, actually I'm really excited with the future in uh, Toi Māori especially in the Waikato, because Holly has this really fresh approach to her mahi, uh, but is very articulate and well-researched. She likes to well-research her mahi, so um, she always comes with an informed approach. So it's beautiful to have you here today, Holly. Um, just a bit of a cordial that she sent through. Uh, Holly's an artist, a tinkerer, and a curator and currently manages the Ramp Gallery at Winte, uh, i.e. Te Pukinga at the Kirikiriwa City Campus. And Holly's passion for the arts is evident in her ability to say no to any involvement in anything promoting and supporting arts, specifically that is not Māori and Wahine. So she's a strong advocate for Toi Māori and getting us into those spaces and places where we need to be. So welcome, Holly, and I'll hand the mic over to you. Um, tēnā kūhā. Uh, kia ora e hoa. Uh, ngā mahi nui, uh, Nathan, for your beautiful kōrero. Um, 
Wow, uh, what a what a show to follow! Thanks a lot. <laughs> but no, it'll be good. It'll be great. Um, and thank you again, Regan, for inviting me on. And uh, kia ora koutou katoa, everybody. Um, yes, I. It's my inability to say no. I I can't I can't do it. And I also don't want to do it. I genuinely love um, the mahi I do. I love art. I love Māori art. I love wahine art. I just love a lot of things and um one of the blessings of my adhd is that i have the energy to do it so i'm gonna and until the um system beats me down hopefully i will remain fresh and energized and loving what i do so let's just not let the system do that <laughs> now i'm going to share my screen and i'll just give you a quick corridor about um my experience in curating and some some a chat about my mahi as well. So it actually began with you, Regan. Hey, when I first, uh, she was, I was doing volunteering. She installed it yourself in Horumona, had your Taonga Puhoro um, exhibition at the University of Waikato campus. And um, I ran into this beautiful woman who was really excited and really supportive and was, and I was like, hmm, I'd love to get into curating, but I don't know if I can do it. And this, this chick was just like, yeah, just do it. Like, stop talking about it, just get into it. So thank you, Regan, for that, because from there I did. And I'll start with, um, here we go. So share. Now let me know if you can see this is coming through okay. It's fine. Awesome, cool. So um, I did, I was allowed to curate my first show at the university and since then it's kind of snowballed and I'm 100% appreciative to um, Terrace for allowing me to do this. But um, every year at the university, they have a Kingitanga day. And I, it can be quite a divisive day, clearly. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to do was take out an aspect of it that I felt most people would be able to relate to. and. I chose Kotaitanga. Um, and so what you can see here is a timeline of events specific to the Kingitanga from basically the landing of Tainui, as we understand it. Um, I am also open to change. I do love to research, but I'm open to change and I will change my opinions as better information presents itself. <laughs> Um, I feel like that's a healthy way to be and one of the best things about my kaumatua being very direct with me and saying actually you're wrong is you learn very quickly to accept that and be okay with it. So here is um, the exhibition called Tahitanga. I did it pulling entirely from the collection that they have across the campus so you can see apologies for my photos. Um, you can see there we have Shane, we have um, oh my goodness, I can't quite see that even myself and it was quite a while ago. But um, in these middle parts, we also had some taonga from our Mareikura room. They have a collection of taonga, including um, writings from Peter Hirinui Jones, um, books from Te Puya. They have a really good collection of Māori resources at the university specific to Tainui. And I felt like it was just the opportune moment to bring them out but also I needed something that would ground the cope up of the show because um it was one thing and very much like yourself Nathan hey you have to have your tupuna present in some way and um another thing I noticed is they let me know very quickly where they did and did not want to be so it was good to have be able to have that quoted and I think this is an important reason why we need to have Māori showing our stuff because we understand that they don't want to be in certain places they don't want to be standing next to someone else sometimes and they'll let you know very quickly and you have to be able to pick up on that so a lot of the show even though I had had conversations with um, other curators was based on gut so where things went was very much um instinctual so when you were saying Nathan oh I don't know why I did it that way I just did sorry I was just like no I completely understand that I do that all the time <laughs> um and because this particular room opens from both ends we had a fucker papa book that Tapuya had commissioned um of the Kingi Tanga, and then on one side it was all the way up through the deities and it was this beautiful big two-paged old book 
that I was just like, oh, maybe we should put it at the opening or maybe we should put it at this end. And it was like, no, I'm going in the middle, like right in the middle. This is my spot. And it ended up working perfectly because it was kind of like we had this transition from, um, so Aki 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 by uh, Manu Scott was at the end that was kind of like the contemporary uh, reflection on where we've come from which I really enjoyed as you moved through from that side, because you could start from both ends, but there wasn't any like linear timeline. It was very much a place that you could access, but still understand the perspectives of the space, uh, of the works that were in the space. So um, you can see in the middle there is a little piece that I chucked in. And, um, and that's Wayne with the two brown paper bags um, saying um, Māori and Pākehā, and those are called, I believe, um, I am what you make me. It was, a, was probably one of the more powerful works in the show, um, but for good reasons too. I thought it was going to be quite divisive, but it, it um, sat really wonderfully next to Sandy's mahi and seemed to like just help bring all of these perspectives together in quite a harmonious way, which I appreciated. Um, but across from it as well, we had some taonga in a case that belonged to Kingitanga and the kings that had passed. So I don't have photos of those, obviously. But um, all in all, it was a very like earth shattering experience to be my first show. <laughs> it was a lot of, I was, there was a lot of mana that I had to treat around very carefully. But um, I realized quickly as well as I was going through the process that I didn't need to be so concerned. Um, because as long as you're listening out and paying attention and just doing your best, usually they'll help you put things in the right place. And I don't have a picture of it too, but there was also a lovely picture of Huripaki, which I had at one end, um, who for me was my favorite piece. And that's because Huripaki was actually just a stalwart supporter of the Kingitanga. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge um, people that use basically are the leg power for big movements like this. Like in a lot of instances, and I know my name, I'm like, I'm Holly Tafio, I fuck a papa kingitanga, et cetera. But um, I have my own reservations about certain parts of the kingitanga. I'm very open about it um, because I don't like for myself to have the unquestioned good and the unexamined bad. I don't like having um, yes and no's. I do like to review things and be like, mm, maybe we could do this better. So, um, did I, how have I put this together? Weird. Anyways, so a um, little while later, I <laughs> applied for a bunch of jobs, got a bunch of no's, and then got one yes. And I ended up working here as a curator at Wintech. And this was my first show. So this one here was Lissy and Rudy Cole, um, the Te Aho Mutunga Kore. So we actually, I actually inherited this show and um, was so excited, went full hog and fangirled all over the place. So now we're good friends because they didn't really have a choice. And um, the way that this was a, a fun show to put together because normally there's a lot of input from the artists and that's like, that's completely fine with me. I love when they know exactly how they want works to hang. But um, in conversation with Lissy, she was just like, no, nah, man, hang it how you want, babe. And I was just like, well, I'm going to, and I hope you're prepared for that. So what I did was we had the neons in the window and it was, the goal was to move from this, from this like ethereal space. Um, I do enjoy talking with people about, um, you know, terrestrial and celestial knowledge. And, and the, that's why I love you, listening to you talking about the, the unity at the horizon because there is that, there is that, um, it's kind of like a water system, hey, that, that transition of movement and knowledge through like that way. I love thinking of things in those kinds of cycles. So how I had it was obviously you'd see these from the window and then you'd come inside and um, I didn't put a picture of them, silly me. Um, you'd had um, Hineti Rama and um, Uru Te Ngangana, 
in the um in the secondary hall and then you'd go from there and then you'd transition to this room and this room was basically the grounding room the terrestrial like the issues that we were having today and kind of working back from the whakapapa of just our, our knowledge bases and how we deal with things and remembering to return to that start to be like this is where we can we can look back to get solutions for now and um I did have a close up of the mind that Māori vest because that is one of my favorite pieces because it's it's actually just such a gentle and soft way of being like this is something that we should have at the forefront of mind and that high visibility um, and children as well like hey do you mind that child that um that just be careful and cautious and and we're here and you can see us so start taking a little bit more care so other shows oh there it is there we go. Um, so other shows that we have had since I've been here, because I only started last August and I've kind of um, been going um, hell for leather. Uh, so we did have, it's a stitch up. So this was an exhibition that was just about, just from a bunch of people that like to work in textiles, um, crocheting, embroidery, etc. And it was it was quite interesting to transition from doing this big Te Ao Māori one into one that I knew nothing about. I know nothing about textile arts. So when it comes to um, being a Māori curator um, and having to switch between the two, it seems like it would be hard, but because we're basically switching all day, every day, it works out fine in the end. But um, it was handy too, because Rachel did all the curating. <laughs> so I really, I just had to manage that. I really appreciated that. But this was a fun one because it was genuinely just being able to celebrate putting the wicks in the space. It wasn't, it didn't have anything heavy or loaded. I didn't have to worry about, oh, well, some of the stuff was a bit heavy. <laughs> there was some beautiful, uh, there was a beautiful piece in there by Paul Yor, which was looking at, well, these were heavy too, actually. Oh, now that I'm thinking about it, I really should have phrased my words better. But um, it was still fun to do. And, and the conversations that came out of it. So this one is about um, uh, like invisible female labor and domesticity. And she got a bunch of women to make these um, doormats, you know, like that doesn't say a lot. I don't know what does. But then we did have a big, beautiful piece by Paul Yor as well, which was of the Disney princesses performing fellatio whilst they had like various body fluids on them it was in a big embroidered um disney sheet and that was one of the ones we thought was going to be more sensitive but um yeah the, it meant that that people came into the space were actually really open to having those conversations like yes i can see how this would blah blah, blah. so it's actually incredibly rewarding and if we can do this kind of corridor for other people's work especially when we don't understand it Imagine how much better it's, it is when we're talking about our own stuff, just between you and I. Um, and Nathan knows this one because <laughs> he's written for the book that we had for the show. This is the one we've recently just closed and it's heading from us down to Adam Art Gallery and it's going on to Christchurch Art Gallery. So um, this was a lot of work. If you were ever wanting to get into curation and you're ever going to be the organizer of a touring show, I highly recommend you don't. Um, <laughs> it is hard work, unless you are well resourced and a wonderfully big institution that focuses heavily on artworks and can access crates, make frames, etc. cetera. Um, a, a whole legal team that can deal with your loan agreements, your exhibition agreements. Like I don't mean to scare the heck out of you, but, but holy goodness, the last few months have been a lot of work but rewarding because it means that now that I've got a huge wealth of knowledge, best advice I can give, just try it. <laughs> and if you fail, it's fine, just learn. Um, but I found that this was a humongous learning curve. I didn't actually know Barbara Tuck um, prior to this exhibition. And the more that I learned about her work and basically her perseverance in the art scene, the more I just became uh, completely enamored of her. So, um, this one, if I'm talking from like a cur curatorial perspective, it is predominantly about having to manage a touring show. I, I remember speaking, we had a wonderful uh, Māori curators wānanga here at, um, in the gallery at the end of last year. And we were talking about how the success of, of Māori, like con our contemporary Māori artists such as such as Paramatchit, hey, and how they would actively travel around to each other's shows and support, like the the car hikoi essentially you go from place to place and you actively support your people um 
I think if we can get a handle on touring shows <laughs> and and just make them really work to our benefit, it's gonna and have our our artists showing in more places, then um, I think that we should do that. And whilst this was a bit of a nightmare, it's actually turned out giving me some really good um, fodder from which to plan some touring events for the future. So, um, and then I think I've got some of my work in here now. Let me just check. So moving away from curating. Oh yes, there we go. Um, so this is, I should, I'm originally a painter. Um, because my father is in Toy for Kaido. He does carving, he's been carving for um, well over three decades now and probably coming up on four. And I um, I have a uterus, so I'm not allowed to in Tainui, essentially. So, <laughs> so I, this is another thing that I do. Um, my dad taught me anyways. So I've also learned um, Toy for Kaido from my father. He has no sons and both my sister and I learned. My sister's gone down the pathway of Raranga. Um, but because it was so taboo for so long. I just picked up a paintbrush because I had to have a creative outlet. And if it wasn't going to be a chisel, it was going to be something else made out of wood. Um, so this was a little bit of my background. I did go to Elam. Um, didn't particularly enjoy it, but I'm a small country girl and like small city girl. And going to Auckland was a bit overwhelming. And I didn't understand words like lexicon or um, vernacular, et cetera. Um, so it was a huge, steep learning curve for me. And then I went there and started and was like, I like to paint. And they were like, well, that's a bad idea because everyone likes to paint. So maybe you should do conceptual art. And I did. <laughs> I did a big switch. Now it's not moving forward. Oh, there we go. So yes, um, Elam ended up making me overthink everything, which is something I was doing anyway, but now it goes into my work. So here, this is the piece I had in the show. Um, this was... Uh, a bunch of candies, a bunch of lollipops that I'd made out of tongue that I'd been given. And like this here. So this is where I like to look at, at the boundaries between things. Like for example, this here is carving wood chips, which we burn and are burnt, but I had made silicone molds of and then poured with white chocolate chips. Some, it was difficult to have the conversations in Elam because I didn't have the Māori counterparts to like bounce this idea around but my father and I and like other carvers especially we've had some really good in-depth conversations about things like this and it seems that um, another thing I would really appreciate more of is um, of, of safe spaces to have those conversations um, I do like being in a gallery where you can kind of throw stuff like that out there and people are forced to talk to you about it as soon as they walk through the door so um, Moving on from that, this was uh, Kotahitanga. I did um, I did this for another Kotahitanga, not the exhibition that I started with, but this one was last year, and it was by Creative Waikato, um, coming out of COVID with all the um, like division and and hate that was circulating at the time. They were just trying to think of a way to bring people together using art. Um, so I did this. This was also me being a little bit cheeky, like carving but not carving. I um, sliced up slithers of I did planing on um, different types of wood and stuck them all together to try and make it like a form a whole. I do like to use resources as far as I can, um, but the main point here is just basically showing that you can kind of start playing with elements of things and putting them together and you can bring things together that wouldn't normally fit and just force it to work or not force it, but you can make it work. Um, and you can create something quite fun or quite beautiful from it. Um, oh yeah, and this is, so this was the start of my masters, which I've started this year because I can't sit still. Um, this is my father and I carving the marae for, uh, the maihi for our marae, a pet te So the, um, the thing with these as well is because they are to replace maihi that were, weren't maintained. The whole reason I got into museums uh, was because I wanted to learn how to maintain dad's work um, but the problem is we don't as far as I'm aware we don't have a cons conservation paper or anything here in New Zealand hey you had to go to Australia to do it and I didn't have money to do that so but um, it's good because it means that I've had that hands-on experience with dad to learn how to take care of this stuff since um, and that has grown into I got to show with Regan at Wilder. So one of the big things that, uh, that I do like to look at as well, which I feel is like 
intrinsically from my Māori side is sustainability and just being just conscious of our environment, the processes we use, the things we use. Uh, the gallery that I run at the moment, we are now trying to reduce our waste as much. We don't use vinyl anymore for our um, labels. Um, we can we avoid plastic where we can. We do laser cutting with cardboard. It's just just actively trying to honor our responsibilities to the environment in that way. And I am looking at getting changing the paint from because we currently use resin, but we want to change it over to I believe there's a sustainable paint company down in Christchurch um, that we are hoping to switch over to. So it's just things like that. We can do better. Try do better. Sometimes you can't. I recognize that's hard. I still drive a car, so um, <laughs> didn't come to work on my walker. Now, um, so this one here, uh, these are based on, um, what do you call them? Plum bobs that were on surveyors equipment when they divvied up the Waikato land because it was so good for dairy. So each of these hanging at the, at the top is a bridge. Um, they're all four bridges that are significant to me. So it's the bridge at Topiti that goes over um, Mangafara stream. There's the bridge at, oh goodness, Anzac Street Bridge, which is where I live now over in Hamilton East. There's um, the bridge at Rangariri, which is my other marae at Moria. And then there's the bridge at uh, Tuakau, which goes to my other marae at Port Waikato. So um, the plants and the water in each of the glass uh, plum bobs at the bottom as well comes from each of those spaces. And they lived, they're still alive. They're growing in my house right now. But it was basically just a commentary on the distance between us and the river now, how we don't see the health declining um, because we're not on it anymore. We've got bridges, we just go over it and ignore it now. And also just enclosing that nature so that um, to be like, well, it's not the river or the environment that needs us. So maybe let's be a little bit more conscious. I understand it's a bit preachy, but you know what? It was fun. And then... What else do we have? Oh, and my other one, this one's Kato. So this one was a painting I did in response to um, the river in general. It was just a complete free flow, which is unlike me. Um, and it had images of my family or memories that I had on the river. So you had to stand in front of it and move around it for the gold shimmer to be able to see what was actually going on. And just, this is really tricky. So this is what I'm working on now with my masters. Um, I do enjoy using like technology <laughs> as a person who just spouted off a bunch of stuff about the environment. I am, have just fallen in love with a laser cutter. So I don't entirely know how to uh, ethically round myself on that one. I guess I'll just have to do some mental gymnastics. But um, <laughs> this is me taking the form of the Pakati. And it was the first pattern I learned how to do. Um, mainly because my dad hates cleaning them. So it was the first pattern I learned how to clean out and then the first pattern I learned how to do. And when I was, when I was for my master's looking at um, Tainui, say, patterns specifically, and then I was like, Ngāti Tipa, and my dad was like, well, you're going to have to look at Hauraki because that's where we're actually from. I was like, wow, history, this hurts. And then um, he said, but if you want to go into something, Pākati is good, but also the Tauta pattern. So I'm starting to look at turning it into a rope or forms like that. But the main thing I wanted to do here and with the laser cutter was to push the wood to its limit and just see how we can, because what's important to me and my masters is how we as Māori, as Māori practitioners, curators, artists, writers, etc., how we are actively changing um, our living culture. You know, that, that step away from um, this us and them between us and our tūpuna and that, that recognition of it being a fluid um, transition and that it should be our hands that are helping with that transition. It should be our thoughts, it should be our words, etc. So this is me playing with wood, hopefully in the way that um, were my ancestors here, they would have enjoyed doing too. Like, oh, we can start to push things a little bit further this way and being informed by that. So I don't know if this will play. We'll see. This is one that I've put up on. No, it's not working. Oh, can I just say yes? Uh, trust this one time. So well, I went to my pa. I didn't have, I couldn't find all the stuff for it. Darn, it's not working. I'm sorry. But I did have to get it. From, but basically, I got some wood from um, my our pa, Te Uapata pa at the foot of Topi and just started slicing it into really thin sheets and thin veneers so that the light could pass through it. 
and um, I'm just looking at one of the things that I think I think about a lot is how we are so considered of uh, we consider a lot uh, the fuck proper of the materials we use when we're doing art and the fuck proper of pretty much anything we're handling or using not just for our own safety but it's just it's just being considerate in a lot of times as well so I'm really gutted I can't show this because it's actually quite fun they're very thin these are actually pine veneers though this isn't the wood I cut but it's very thin pine veneer that's so light you can suspend it and just looking at the at um for Kaido, um being a method by which you can actually it doesn't have to be this big heavy clunky thing we can start being quite ethereal with our works and how they're presented and they can look quite um quite I don't want to use the term feminine but quite um I don't know interesting and just get you to wonder how how things like how it was done so is that working no it's still not working oh sorry and I ended up and I've done a few things with um Lissy and Rudy <laughs> I forgot to mention that too it just popped up but it's not showing up now oh there we go so this is um Tupuanuku which I carved out and um for their whare and Lissy's currently um, populating with flowers and, and leaves and vines and such. So I, I think that's it. <laughs> uh, kia ora and thank you oh. for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> kia, ora, kia ora Holly, that's wonderful. Uh, thank you. Kia ora. And, uh, and what's um, really obvious that's coming through in uh, both your kōrero, you know, is that connection to tūpuna and sharing uh, stories. And I love um, both of you, how you touched on, um, especially in the curatorial practice, that things um, happen because they're meant to, because they just feel right. Uh, and you don't really know necessarily why it's happening, but then um, things happen down the track, I'm sure, uh, where you're like, oh, this has happened because I did that and um, now I can see the importance of that. Um, do you both have anything um, you'd like to share in terms of Nathan? Uh, was there any incidences that you can think of through your curatorial practice where you've... Um, mm. yeah. yeah, I think so. Um, um, the, thing, the thing with um, being... Uh, aware of, culturally aware of, and sensitive to allowing those um, moments to take place is, um, is, um, is a sort of a, can be a bit of a nail biting thing when you are also working with colleagues that need decisions from you. And um, so you need to be able to roll with things and understand that, um, Curating like art making is really problem solving. An artist creates a visual problem and then starts to resolve it through the, through the process of finally getting to finish something. Like a painting, for example, is a, is a, is a really good way to think about that. Um, but it happens in conceptual art too, and the things can change and you've got to be able to um, have the confidence in, um, what you're doing and why you're doing it and the way that you're doing it to tow the line through those bits that kind of feel like there's no air under you or there's only air under you I should say there's no ground so much and um, there's a bit of risk involved and um, but the the surefire thing is that another problem will present itself and start to answer that problem that you had before um, and you can resolve two or three things at once, and it all aligns with matoranga or tikanga Māori. That's the point that you get to, and that, that becomes the sweet spot, if you like. You've just got to be prepared to, to be led there, <laughs> which is, again, difficult when you're working in an institution, and I absolutely tell Toku um, Holly in terms of... Um, what it is to arrange a traveling exhibition without all those resources and all that staff and all that internal support that um, someone like myself has always seen. I just can't imagine what you went through and we have and probably are still going through Holly 
with um, yeah. a traveling show uh, like that. That is no framing. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Let alone crates, insurances, and everything else you have to contend with. Uh, my hat, tip my hat to you, man. That is amazing. <laughs> oh, thank you. It was, it was a thing, but it's been really good. And now I can do it for our people, so that's fine. Right. <laughs> cool. That's awesome, Nathan. And um, when you're talking to about uh, you know, um, having our tikanga and our tūpuna as guiding, um, you know, guiding our, our curatorial practice, I remember when I first met Holly as she walked into the Taonga Puru exhibition, we were setting up with her white gloves and she was ready to help. And then she looked at me and she went, you've got no gloves on. And I was holding these taonga puro. And um, I know the artist who, who made that piece is Brian Flintoff, you know, and his, um, his whole perspective on taonga puro is, it, is that they're living. And to him, it's sacrilege to have them sitting on a shelf and not feel the aroha and love of a, a person, you know, because that's what they're made for. But when they're put in an exhibition context, of course, they're separated and you can't touch them because they're precious and they're taonga. So it's that whole different way of viewing our taonga. And I remember Holly's face going, oh, like that was a big no-no. Um, and then when I explained <laughs> to her, you know, I know the artist and he wants us to love the taonga. Yeah. Yeah, because they feel it and then they glow and, and she was like oh I didn't realize it could be like that and just yeah approaching things with the old Maori perspective but not just doing it just because but doing it because mm. you know respecting the wishes of the artists and the taonga and of course you wouldn't do that to every taonga because some would disintegrate you know in your hands right. but yeah, yeah. Okay. um I could share an incident where something went completely surprise for me uh, as an artist I can share that with you when we were in taking the work to Castle Germany the photograph I showed you of the work and that beautiful park with the with the whole massive ginormous park behind it in the hills that wasn't the spot that I picked for my <laughs> tupuna they picked that um, honestly I had said to my curator this is where I'd like for it to go um would you like for me to send you a picture and because i'd modeled it you know made a photoshop collage of it and he goes no no i know what you mean and i say like, okay great uh would you like me to send you a geo tag of the spot in the park he goes no 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 i know exactly what you mean and i go okay and then i get to germany and i and i go oh it's there that's that's not where i was thinking at all and I'd say to myself, but you guys look great. <laughs> I think I think you guys actually, uh, you know, you can call it a miscommunication, but we were so careful about so many things over the duration of that exhibition. And I came to see it and said, this is not where I meant to be. And I showed him the picture of what I was thinking. He goes, oh, that's very different. And, um, and we looked to move it it was going to cost ten thousand euro and there was it was opening in three days or five days or whatever it was there wasn't enough time to shift it because you need to pour concrete and all sorts of things and um and so we just stayed there and just rolled with it and but and i thought about it over the days and looked at the other site and looked at where it is and looked back at the other site and looked where it is and it's like yeah no this is where you were meant to be they looked amazing. And that wasn't the first time that that sort of incident had happened over the five years of that project. But Holly must have something. Come on, Holly. <laughs> I do, actually. But mine was in a painting. Um, it was Lagiaho. So I did a... We were doing... Um, so the Two Heitia Portraiture Comp that was started by the National Portrait Gallery. And I entered and... Um, I did Rangiaho, who, by my understanding, was Tafiao's second wife, um, passed away young. This is all things I'd been told, like, oh, she passed away young and all this and all that. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. So I'll start play. I'll paint her from the only picture I could find. And I was like, she had a, a moko on, but I didn't, I couldn't see it properly, so I didn't want to do it injustice. So I 
left it off um and also was wearing I didn't know who she was wearing so I left that off as well because um you have to basically have permission to paint these tupuna and I was like no I'm not going to have I don't know who I can't see it probably I don't know who you are it's fine um so I painted her and as I was doing it I was like I can't find any information ask my family because everyone's just like they only care about the, you know, the big important people. It's just like, no, tell me about the women. I want to know about the ladies in my family. They sound like badass. And then um, couldn't find a damn thing. Went into the, um, per chance, I think. I went into the library and I was like, look, how do I find out any information about like ancestors? A couple of clicks later, he's like, just walk across the street to the land court. It looks like there's some corridor in there about her. And so I went into the land court it was almost like the book had semi fallen on the table for me. And it was not caught at all about her. It was her old, like married four times, um, was living in Kafia, was this prominent, like woman that knew a bunch of stuff and was just amazing. Um, 16 pages of her corridor about land and about the, who had claimed to it and just telling her whakapapa and telling her story about how she knows all this and who she lived there with. And I was just like, this is gold. It was so excited. It seemed like it, it was a bun it was a series of happy accidents. And then I just came with this huge wealth of knowledge. And then as I was painting her, because I didn't know how to dress her, I was like, man, I'm gonna wrap her up in something see-through, like something transparent. So I had her in in um cellophane. I had her wearing a cellophane, almost like a it was supposed to be semi-reminiscent of the Madonna. And I also had her bearing her shoulders. It was like, and it just it just took on this whole life of its own as I was making it. Whereas originally I was trying to make her quite young and like playful and, you know, I was just like, oh, she died young, that sucks. But no, she was wow. older and awesome and deserved to be seen. And so I just tried to make her like this big holier than thou figure and stuff and just really, and but also with the connotations of this is a gift, these are important things, you know. Like it was a really, it was really interesting turn midway because I'd already painted her, um, but there were a few tweaks and changes I could make thereafter that just, just made it all whole because up until that it did feel kind of, it didn't sit right. And another, actually another thing, this wasn't me, this was my dad, but he carved, um, did a carving at the airport. And I remember we went to the opening and we got to go in this special little car and they take you around the airport with clearance and stuff. And I remember walking up to the piece and being like, oh, this does not like me. This hates me and I don't know why. And um, dad was like, oh, this person carved it. That's why they don't like you or Pocky because we carve. And I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. I didn't realize you could do that. And he goes, yeah, no, that's why you, you should probably be in a good state of mind whenever you're creating anything. You don't, you don't want to put that kind of, you know, you don't want to put that white oil into your piece. So um, yeah, to this day, I can't walk through that gate without, shuddering a bit but yeah it's I, I think things work out how they work out for a good reason <laughs> that amazed me oh sorry uh, Regan that it, amazed, it, it was really nice to hear that your tupuna uh, wahine had married four times normally you hear that about the men but you never think that the woman might also marry a number of times and that really does shift quite a bit of um, thinking around the world that our Tupuna lived in. That's awesome. Thank you. That was yeah. <laughs> very cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, I remember the Toy Māori exhibition when they talked about that and the artworks in that show that toured around America and um, the, the interesting things that happened that really evidenced mm. to uh, non-Māori curators that there was something more uh, to those works that they had a Modi and a Wairua. Uh, do is there anything that um, that you've experienced uh, in terms of that, Nathan? I remember at the Tefiki show and those pieces from Maketu. Uh, you know, I felt like they were calling me. And um, Maketu, we used to always go there and collect puppies when I was young. Uh, and um, and then it, it looked like they were kind of looking you know, and I was like, oh, I wonder why you're here, you know, it really kind of made me question, so it was, it was lovely to have met you, Nathan, and to have been able to talk about um, that whole journey of them coming to the show, but mm. yeah, what's your experience? 
um, uh, really things just moved really smoothly with them. Um, they were well cared for at Canary Museum and the in the um, and by the institution. The institution's got a very um, uh, very it operates really carefully with Taonga and responsibly and has a has an excellent um, uh, cultural advisory group, which includes and, and actually includes somebody from Makitu as well. And um, so those pieces, I think, have been well settled and cared for and um, and uffied. And uh, so your your experience is 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 really, I think, um, quite special. And they probably more likely recognise something in you. Uh, I was just simply uh, giving them a platform for a while uh, to be able to come out and, and address the world a bit. Perhaps that's a, a curiosity thing uh, as well for them. Um, I mean, um, yeah, I don't know, everything went really, really smoothly. And I was so, so um, pleased to be able to bring them over from Canary Museum into Te Puno Waifetu and acknowledge them as artworks and uh, as living Taonga or living Tupuna. And, um, and up over the, because I'd actually brought them into the gallery and had been exhibited them across three years or four years over different exhibitions. Once we got them in the building and, and uh, were able to, to nurse them on the wall, uh, it was a real, just such a beautiful thing to have in the building and it was, did not want to let them go back. <laughs> <laughs> really was the thing and kept finding ways or they kept presenting ways perhaps or, or the programming that I was involved with just keep finding ways to keep them in the building. So I was looking at Māori art and architecture. Um, I've got an interest in our, uh, all of our forms, uh, cult, customary forms of art making and, and the architecture and being one and in, in, you know very particular one because it incorporates raranga, um, painting, kofaifai, whakairo as well as architecture and these things are if you like artworks in themselves come together to produce what's really an artwork that we use as a whare and, um, uh, and they were invented specifically for that very same purpose. Their purpose was to house the, um, uh, uh, what were they, the um, core, uh, core Māori of the, uh, of the um, chiefs of uh, Makitu. And, and that in itself, the where they come from, what they participated in as a, as a architectural structure was incredible. I mean, that your guys' fuddy from, from up there is mind-blowing. That is a piece of, of Aotearoa architecture like nothing else I've ever seen in my life. It's just stunning. And it's a mind-blowing little fuddy, that one. So, so, so special. So it's a massive honour to um, have been able to um, provide a space for it, yeah, to, to come and um, engage in the world. And the more I, I find out about our, our the ways of our tupuna, which is something I'm learning as I go, uh, which to me feels kind of risky, but is I'm getting more comfortable with as the years go by. Uh, yeah, the better it, it gets, and hopefully the stronger the ideas get too. Yeah, because that's what curatorial really practices. It's we're hired for our ideas, and. Um, you know, so that's what Holly's got going on. It's what you've got going on there. It's what we're all participating in is, is our ideas and um, the values that we bring through in, in our mahi. That's it, Nathan. And it's so refresh, refreshing and beautiful to hear, uh, you know, as curators, you're talking about living taonga and you're talking about Modi and you're talking about wairua and normalizing all those concepts, you know, and when um, Māori artists come into that space, 
they Goodbye. don't have to explain themselves you know you just understand already and it, it becomes that safe space to share those stories mm -hmm. and um, be yeah. yeah so wonderful so um we're nearly we're nearly up for time but if you'd both like to share anything then please feel free um holly did you have anything to share I do actually. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to run off and grab my charger. I realized I was like, oh, we're getting below. Um, so another thing, this is something that I've just started looking into, and it's probably going to be my next project after I finish, finish my master's. But um, I'm just not having a play on the laser code. I don't know if you can see this. Ah, can you see that? Oh, yeah. So it says, yeah, I just made some earrings. They're called, um, I've got the word colonized er on it. Um, I just... <laughs> I thought it was a, a fun, like an accessible way for me to start looking at both of my both sides of my fucker papa because I am half Pakia, I am half Māori. And um, I know a lot of times in conversations where we're like, you know, decol, let's do this. Um, and we take a position of Māori solely. I'm like, no, actually, I'm half colonizer as well. I'm perfectly fitted to be in a position to make these changes myself as well. Mm. So I think, like, for yeah. me, anyways, I want to recognize. Um, all sides of my, like all of my tupuna, all sides of my ancestry and and look at both the, the pretty stuff, the fun stuff, but also some of the not so pretty stuff, not so fun stuff and start addressing that in my mahi um, and being able to talk about it comfortably so hopefully we can move forward from it. And um, yeah, that's something that I think is also is also a good thing to do in your practice and, and just having some really good solid like... Um, <laughs> understanding of where you come from and where you stand helps and also being comfortable shifting that sometimes because it's not all going to be pretty yeah yeah you're talking about dualities there and your own mm. papa and your own makeup and identity i i know exactly what you're talking about of course yeah that's that's the modern maori modern experience it's the contemporary Māori part of the contemporary Māori experience isn't it is that complexity of of um whakapapa. and um yeah and I I, I come from a, a whānau that's exactly the same and and um uh and what, what was this what, yeah I, I just I told you that yeah it's great yeah, I think that's where um, Māori curators and artists come with an advantage because we're used to walking in the Te Aupākehā world, eh, but mm. we also can traverse into Te Ao Māori, you know, wherever we're comfortable mm. in that space. And the more we learn about ourselves, uh, then we can come from a stronger platform. Mm. Um, so I'd just like to... Um, give a, a huge mahi to you both, Nathan and Holly. Thank you today for sharing so openly about your beautiful mahi, your practices and your uh, curatorial practices. And I'm really looking forward to the future and um, watching those amazing stories unfold that you will be presenting uh, for our futures. And thank you for your time today. And uh, hopefully we catch thank up again you. soon at uh, another... Um, I'm sure at one of those curatorial kaupapa that are coming up. But you have something say. opening next week, don't you, here in Kirikiri Law at the Don't You Have Some Stuff? Who? You're okay. in Toya's Rungo, aren't you? Uh, Toya's Rungo is opening, yes, next There you Friday, go. Yeah, at the um, Waikato Museum. Feet through curated. doors, support our artists, guys. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I'd love by. to. Yeah, that would be awesome if you can make it. We'd love yeah. to see you there. And I have um, oh, some catch up quarter or two, Nathan. I've met some people and um, who are talking right. about the Chatham Islands and, and all sorts oh. of cool stuff. Yeah. So awesome. um, looking forward awesome. to catching up again with you both. I, can I can I just add one more, one, one last thing? Definitely. Um, to Holly's quarter. And this is what I was thinking of when she was speaking and the around those complexities and those dualities mm -hmm. and facing them, having the courage to face them and accept them for what they are. And one of the, and the other thing is to look at our commonalities. And also it's, a, it's a, in this kind of a, um, looking, we don't need to see ourselves as victims in any of this. We're our own people. 
And one of the things that our whakapapa also points to is aroha, is the aroha of our tupuna that brought us to where we are. So I'll just leave there. Kia ora. Yeah. Thanks, Holly. Thanks. Uh, Kia ora. Thanks, yeah. Nathan. I think those are perfect and pertinent words for us to finish on today. So tēnā kōra, uh, kei te mihi nui kia kōra kua whakapiri mai nei i tēnei rā, i rungi i te aroha, te whakapono me te whakaaro pai. Kia ora, tēnā kōra, tēnā kōra. O te rā, kia koutou mātaki mai nei, tēnā koutou, hei ko nei wā. Hei <laughs> ko nei. Kā kite. Kā kite. Kā kite.